Hello everyone. Uh, this video today is a little bit different from what I'm used to uploading. Um, briefly, the story is that I was reading a book. Uh, it's titled Machine Learning with R by Brett Lands, the third edition. And it's a really, really beautiful book. And I found this algorithm. It's my favorite. And um, the weird thing is that I did not find any video for this on YouTube. There are no tutorials for this. No one seems to be talking about it, even though it's a very, very powerful algorithm. It combines the concepts from both linear regression and regression trees or decision trees. So I'm assuming that if you're watching this video, you should be already familiar with both of these um, machine learning algorithms, linear regression and decision trees. If you are not, then I'll put links below in the description and I'll pin a comment as well um, with links to teach you both linear regression and decision trees because this algorithm today actually combines both of these uh, concepts together into a much more powerful model. So anyways, like I said, this is a model combining both and to enable more people to learn these things in order to be helpful for anyone, hopefully, I've decided to make this video covering it in a small demonstration. Um, so let's get started. This is called the Cubist Model Tree. Now, the algorithm itself is called the Model Tree and the package is by Cubist in R software. So let's get started now. I've created a factitious model. I've created my own data for this uh, example. Okay, and it's about uh, the relationship between drug concentrations for whatever medication, drug concentrations in the blood, uh, compared to the efficacy of that drug. So let's create the data and we have named it right here, as you can see, um, data frame DF. So let's start exploring the data first, just to give you an idea of what we are doing. Um, as you can see here, it's the comparison between concentration and efficacy. Now this is a third random variable. It's all zeros really. Um, and I've added it because this algorithm doesn't seem to work except if we have more than two or more variables. So you can really ignore this variable. Uh, and let's assume that we have these two, um, these two variables alone. Actually, we can have many more variables. I'm not going to talk about this right now. I'll address it later in the video. So it's comparing the concentration and efficacy. So let's plot them. So to get an idea of the variables that we are dealing with, let's say plot df at efficacy and df versus the concentration. I just want to color it because I like fancy things. So let's say color is blue three. Of course, I'm, I'm assuming um, these things really are very easy, so I'm not going to explain them, how to plot things, how to import data. Um, anyone using these algorithm, uh, algorithms should be familiar with these things. Um, so anyways, the color and the X label should be blood concentration. Okay, over. So as you can see here, if we just enlarge it a little bit, you can see now that, oh no, this is not so good. Ah, okay, let's change the order actually because, um, yeah, this doesn't, this is not actually the way I want it to be. Let's put the X axis, that's the mistake I did. The X axis should be concentration, the first one, and then the Y axis should be the efficacy. Now let's plot it. Okay, so that's more like it actually. This looks now proper. As you can see here, we are plotting these two variables against each other in a scatter plot. And this is a very useful plot to, to have an exploration of the relationships between variables before you try to predict them or create a model for them. So as you can see here, um, we have three clusters of data because like I said, I created this data myself. It's not ideal. It's only for demonstration purposes. Um, so you can see here that when we plot the blood concentration on the X axis and the efficacy of the drug, DF at efficacy, I'm not going to, well, actually, let's change it as well. So let's say Y label 
equals drug efficacy. Okay, so now, okay, so everything looks good. Um, so as you can see, the relationship looks a little bit linear, but it's not perfectly linear. Because as you can see here, if you look now at the lowest part of near the, both the zeros and the x and the y axis, you can see that um, the blood concentrations keep increasing for this drug, but the efficacy is not increasing at all. So it's a horizontal relationship. Now, up to a certain point after this range now in this new cluster, the relationship seems to be a little bit linear because as you can see here, between the range of 20 and 40, let's say this is, you know, milligrams per deciliter, the blood concentration in the unit. So in this range, the efficacy increased as well in, in the same region, 20 to 40. So it is a little bit linear here. But as we increase more to the 40 to 60 range, something weird happens and we can see that we've hit a plateau because as we increase beyond 40, it no longer really, the efficacy no longer increases proportionally with the drug concentration in the blood. So if you follow my mouse right here, um, so here we have horizontal, then a linear, then a horizontal relationship again, and we have struck a plateau. So this scatterplot was very, very useful. And if we want to obtain the correlation coefficient between the two, we just do this. So we say COR, correlation, and then just delete the plot, right? So correlation coefficient between the concentration and efficacy. And if you click enter, you will see right here that the concentration, uh, the correlation coefficient is 0 0.87. So that's the Pearson correlation. So there is a relationship, but we can see from the scatter plot that it's not perfectly linear. So if we want to plot it actually, to have a, an illustration for it, it would look like this. So you can see here that we have a, a plateau effect. As you can see, it starts. Now this is uh, the illustration of the data that we just displayed in the R software, in R Studio. So here we have first a horizontal relationship. There is no increase. If this is the concentration, this is the efficacy. We saw earlier, it didn't increase. After a certain point, it goes up. So it's a really good linear relationship. Up again to a certain point where we strike, uh, we, where we strike uh, a threshold. And after that, anything that increases, it, it results in a plateau. So it's horizontal again, just like in the first stage. So this is called the plateau effect. And this brings us now to a very important question. That if we have such relationships like the plateau effect, or if we have curvilinear relationships where something seems to increase linearly up to a certain point where we have a perfect range and then it starts drop, dropping again, how are we supposed to model such a relationship using machine learning algorithms? And if you are already familiar, like I said, with decision trees and regression trees, you can fix this problem with a certain extent um, using the regression trees because of their mechanism, they are very well suited to deal, to deal with um, non-linear relationships. But the good news is that you even have a better algorithm, you even have a better alternative than the regression trees, which is the cubist package, the model trees, which combine both linear regression and decision trees. And this is what we will be explaining. So this is basically how the cubist model trees work. If we want to predict y from x, which is in this case to predict efficacy from, um, from concentration, we put, we create earlier on, we create classification, uh, we create decision trees, we create conditions, and if they are met or not, we progress accordingly. 
So if we meet the first condition or the rules specified, we apply a certain model. If not, we move to a second rule and then a third rule. And of course, this can go up to a very large number. But the point is that in the end, you will reach an end where you cover all alternatives and you will apply different models. Bear with me if this sounds a little bit too confusing. We will explain it very well soon. So uh, let's just follow with the examples. So we had this relationship and now we want to predict it. First, we want to split the data. So um, let's open the library, of course, library CA tools. Of course, um, this is going to split our data into training and testing sets. Um, these things are too simple, so I won't explain them. So we use this package to split the data. So we set the seed, let's say, at zero, and then we say um, split equals sample split where df split ratio equals 0 0.8. So we want 80% of the data to be training and 20% um, of the data to be testing data. Okay, then we move and we say train equals subset and df split equals true and then we say the same thing for the testing data but false and we say here test Okay, so what we've done right here, we've split the data into training and testing sets in order to apply these models. Um, now, let's move on to creating a linear regression model first because we said, now we will compare how a linear regression model works and how a model tree compares to it in terms of accuracy. So let's say linear model equals LM, we want to predict efficacy. So we say um, train efficacy right and then we say delta and we want to use the concentration so we say concentration Let's check the names of the variables. Okay. So the name is concentration. So we want to predict using the linear model, we want to predict efficacy from concentration. So this is our Y variable, and this is our X variable, the, the dependent and the independent variable. Data is equal to um, train okay and then we say so we've built now our model and let's say summary of LM now if you look at the model right here um, it has created this linear regression model with the intercept at 7 so at this area right here and the coefficient or the concentration the, the coefficient for the concentration the beta value is 0 0.62 so it's trying its best to achieve a linear relationship and as you can see right here if we look at the adjusted r squared it is 0 0.77 and the f statistic is significant okay so if we want now to test our variable uh, at the testing data because we have uh, this model we want to test it not on our training data but on the um, test split so let's say y pred which is efficacy the predicted y in our case it's efficacy y pred of the linear regression model so y is efficacy pred because it is our predicted variable not the true va uh, the true value 
the predicted value, not the true value. And LM because we are using the LM linear regression model. To distinguish it now in the future, very soon we'll be comparing it to the model tree. So that's why we are using these um, words. So predict LM from test. So this function right here predicts efficacy using the linear model and the testing data. Because right here, here we trained our model and now we want to, to test the model on testing data. So let's find first the correlation. So this, uh, the y pred variable has been created. Let's find the correlation between y pred lm and test efficacy. So we are now comparing the predicted values of efficacy to the true values of efficacy. And the correlation coefficient is 0 0.78. So core, let's add it into a comment, correlation equals 0 0.8, 7. Okay? And if we want to calculate now the mean absolute error, so let's do this. MAE of LM equals, um, how do we do it? Yeah, mean absolute. And now we subtract Y pred LM. We subtract from it um, the test data, the efficacy. Okay, so The mean absolute error, which is a, me a measure of error, of course now we should note that the more the correlation between the two values, the better. And in the case of the mean absolute error, it's the opposite. So the lower the mean absolute error, the better. So MAE equals 10.4. Okay, so let's also add it as a note. Equals... 10.4, okay, as you can see right here. So we've added it as a note in order to compare them now soon when we will create our model tree. Now, okay. Okay, this is much neater. So now let's move on to our cubist model tree. So we have already now created our, our linear regression model. And as you can imagine, it's very difficult to fit a single linear line using the y equals mx plus b formula because this creates a linear model. And you cannot really fit a straight line very well through all of these points. You will have a large margin of error, but our model that did its best and this is the accuracy or the, the, the quality of the model that we have achieved with a mean absolute error of 10 and a correlation of 0 0.8. So let's now test the cubist uh, model tree. So let's first import the, uh, the library. So library, cubist. Of course, um, if this is your first time using this uh, package, then you should, you should first use install.packages and then use cubist. So you would run this code and then um, turn on the package, but of course, I've already installed it. So we've imported the, this library. And then we say model tree, okay, equals cubist. This is of course just the name that I'm granting it. You can name it anything you want. And the same thing here for this linear model. Um, so cubist, and then we say train, minus two and train at efficacy. Okay, so let me explain this code. Um, cubist, of course, we are using this package. This is the X variable. So we want to use the variable which is concentration. So if we go back to the DF, let's um, actually turn on. DF or train, it's really the same thing. So let's view train. So if you go here, as you can see, the first variable 
is concentration. The second is efficacy. The random, you can really ignore it. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to use the dependent, um, I'm sorry, the independent variables. So here, you first determine the independent variables. If you actually press F1 for help, this is how the, the setup should look like. So you have first the X, then the Y, then the control for the, to prevent overfitting. I will address this in a little bit. So first you put the independent variables, which are the X variables. In our case, we want to use everything except the efficacy itself, because efficacy is our dependent variable. We want to use the rest, which are concentration and the random variable, but you can really ignore it, but we are using it here just to enable our, our example. So we say train minus the second column, which is the column of efficacy. So we want to use this and this without the efficacy column. So that's why we have said we want to use train minus two. This is for training our model. And then our Y variable is train efficacy. Okay, so now we want to control our model tree because as you should already know from uh, decision trees, they are excellent tools, but one of their limitations is that um, they are prone to overfitting. They are greedy and they can overfit the data. So you can use a control command, which is control equals cubist control. And you should say um, rules equals two. And this, now this will be a little bit confusing for now. Uh, so please bear with me, we will come back to it. So you have, you, in this case, you create, just like in decision trees, you determine how many splits do you want or how many um, divisions or splits or how many leaves and so on you want to prevent overfitting or the max depth. Um, in this case, this is its equivalent in the cubist uh, model trees. So you determine how many rules do you want. We will come back to it, but let's put the number three right here. We will explain why we have put a number three. Of course, this can be different in different models, in different data, but in our data, the number three is very suitable and we will address why very soon. So our model tree should be ready. And now let's predict. So let's use, let's say Y pred M3. We want now to test our model on a testing set instead of the training set. Okay, so we say Y pred M3, which is our, our predicted Y value, the efficacy from the model tree. So we say predict using M3 on the testing data, okay? So we have now made our prediction. How do we find the accuracy of the model and compare it to the previously created linear regression? We will use the same methods that we already used. So let's just copy our and paste our code here to save time. So let's first just make an end a column here, a row to avoid confusion. So use pred m, m3, the y pred m3 to compare it to the efficacy. And the correlation coefficient between the predicted y values, the predicted efficacy using m3, the model tree, compared to the true values of efficacy in the, te in the testing set is 0 0.96. So, so that's a much, much more powerful correlation, uh, a much more stronger relationship than the one created by the linear regression model. So let's copy it right here to, as to not forget it. Okay. Okay, and if we want to calculate the mean absolute error, we say MAE of M3 equals mean absolute, the mean of the absolute value 
and we subtract subtract this one from the predicted efficacy using the M3. Okay, so this is the values or the set of values that we have obtained using this function. So we use the model tree on the testing data to predict the efficacy. And we have uh, stored them in this variable. So we are now subtracting this to calculate the mean absolute error. So it's pretty basic. And MAE of M3. So the mean absolute error now is 3.5. And this is really amazing. So MAE equals 3.5. So Okay. Okay, so as you can see here now, the correlation here was between the predicted values, it was 0 0.87. In our cubist model tree, it is 0 0.96. So it's a it's a good it's a good increase. And the mean absolute error in this also linear model, it was 10. But in our new cubist model tree, it became 3.5. So as you can see, this is a much stronger model. Now let's, up to this point, you may be confused because we don't really understand what's happening behind the screen. And um, actually I should have explained this earlier, but let's do it anyways. So let's go back to our PowerPoint slides. So if you look at our relationship here between the concentration and efficacy, it had this shape. The problem is that you cannot fit a single line through all of this data because it will result in inaccuracy. Whether you do it like this, or like this, or like this, you will misestimate many, many values on the opposite side. So how do you solve this problem? If you imagine now, if you can fit a linear regression model, we can easily fit three lines because these are all linear relationships almost, but the problem is that they shift. So we create rules. So first we assume that they are different data. So we cut off the data right here and we create a rule for it. So anything below this certain value, we will use a certain model for it. And then also we cut off the data right here and we will use another model for this range between this point and this point. We will use a different model. And anything above that, we will use a third model for them. So we can use three separate linear regression models according in, in different thresholds, above or below different thresholds. So, and this is exactly what we, we do right here. Um, so if we go back to our data and we go back to our uh, plot, as you can see here, anything below this point, about seven or 10, it is horizontal, in between it is linear, and anything above that is again linear, but horizontal, uh, it's uh, a horizontal relationship, plateau. So this is what our decision tree does. So we go back here. So if you now predict, actually let's, let's go back here to avoid any confusion. Let's analyze the cubist model tree itself. So if we want to see what the model tree has, okay, to interpret the model tree, you say summary, and M3, the name of our model. So we open the screen and here it is. Um, I've intentionally used a small data set with, with only two variables to avoid confusion because this would be much, much more confusing with many variables, even though it can be done, but it can be more confusing for demonstration purposes and for learning purposes. So here, our model tree has been summarized, okay? And um, you can see that here we have, we are reading the 266 cases because our testing set should be 
our training sets, excuse me, it is 266. So we train this model using this number of observations or cases. So this is the number right here. And we have three attributes from undefined data. We have created this model uh, already in R. And this is the model summary. The rule one, so we are now creating thresholds, just like we said um, here, we are using cutoffs, right? So this is exactly why we determine the number to be three. So the rule number one, if, so we have if statements, if the concentration is less than or equal to seven, I'll be ignoring the decimals. So if concentration is less than or equal to seven, then the outcome shall be zero. And this is really what you can observe right here in our data. Anything below this point is equal to zero. It, so our model judges this, ju judges this um, on the, uh, by this number. So on the second rule now, if the first rule was not satisfied, if the first condition was not satisfied, we move on to the second rule. If the concentration is above seven, but below 39, right? So if it is above this area, above this threshold, but below this number, so in this range, and if we go back to our um, diagram right here, you can see if it is above this point, but below this point, we have created a new rule, which is rule number two. So then the outcome is a linear regression model. So a linear regression where the intercept is 20 and the, uh, the beta value, the beta coefficient is 0 0.33 times the concentration. So it takes the form of y equals mx plus b, where y is the efficacy, b is the intercept, which is 20, and m is 0 0.33, and the X is concentration. Now the third and final rule is that it's if it's up, it's if it's neither one or two, if it is above seven and also above thirty nine. So if it is if concentration is greater than thirty nine, then the outcome is sixty. So because it's a horizontal relationship, so we have created three separate linear models using this uh, cubist algorithm. And this is actually what happens right here. Um, so predict y using x to predict efficacy from the drug concentration. Did we meet the first condition? In our case, the condition was to be less than seven point something, less, less than seven. So if we meet this condition, yes, then we will apply the first model, which was y equals, um, what was the formula? Ah, yeah, the outcome is zero, okay? So this is just an example, ignore these numbers. It's actually zero plus zeros, it's all zero. Um, okay, if we haven't met this condition, so if it's above seven, then we go to meet the next condition, which is um, being above seven and below 39. So do we meet this? Because, and this is this cluster, this applies to this cluster of data. So if we meet this condition, yes, then we apply the second model, which is y equals um, 20 plus 33 times concentration. Ignore this number, it's just an example. So we apply this model, which was determined right here. Okay, if not, if the second condition is not met, then we say no, again, no. And we ask, do we meet the third condition, which is being above 39? And because it's, it's now excluding all the possibilities, this is the final possibility, there is no alternative. Yes, and we apply the third model, which is zero times X plus 60. So Y equals 60, which is the value right here that we have found. So um, let's go back to our Model three, yeah. So you can see right here that we create three separate, separate linear regression models, one, two, and three, according to the different thresholds or conditions that we meet. 
So you can see that this model fits this area of the graph very well. This model, which is the second condition, the second rule, fits this area or this portion of the graph very well. And finally, this third model, which is a, a horizontal one again, fits this portion of the graph very, very well. So this is what the cubist model tree does, actually. And um, you can see this again if we go here. So this is the cubist model tree. It's just like a regular decision tree. It starts this way at the beginning with the regular thresholds and conditions, but it splits and ends with linear regression models. In the case of regression trees, you end with numbers, with estimations of numbers of the average, of the mean. While in this case, instead of ending in the average, we end with linear regression models. Um, so let's close this. So like I said, I'm going to explain why we have used the control to be rules three, because if we do not specify this actually, and if we leave it to default, okay, if we apply this now without any um, control, what will happen is that more models can be created. So M3 equals so on. And if we use now M3 summary, now I have removed the limitation. In this case, it did not happen, but more rules can apply. So if you did not set a control variable to control the growth of your tree, it can result in overfitting and it can result in more rules than you want. So according to the scatter plot that I can see, and because I created this data myself, we can already see that we only have three stages of the data. Okay, so we only have the first phase, the second phase, and the third phase. Therefore, I decided that it was ideal to use three um, rules only. And this is why we said uh, we have used this, this code to say control, cubist control equals to three rules. Now, of course, if you're using or you're analyzing unseen data, you would want to um, change the number of rules that you want and cross-validate them using the, using the training set and the testing split to see which one achieves the best accuracy and the lowest mean absolute error and the best correlation and so on. So this is just like any really other algorithm. You keep changing the variables, you validate it, uh, validate it in the testing set to see which achieves the greatest accuracy and the greatest predictive power. Um, so yeah, this was the cubist model and decision trees. I hope that you found this helpful. I mean, this is a really, really amazing algorithm. It's perfectly suitable for finding or analyzing relationships that have a curvilinear relationship, right? So you can never really fit a single line through this relationship, even though it's a clear one, but you, know, you cannot use a, a linear relationship for this. Um, so a cubist model tree can be really ideal here. Or also, like I said, in the, in the scenario where you have a plateau effect, cubist model trees can help you achieve much greater accuracy. Um, so I wanted to share this because, like I said, I didn't find any YouTube videos covering this. And I'd, I also would like to thank um, Dr. Brett Lance for his amazing book, Machine Learning with R. I've really found it insightful and I mean, this is my favorite algorithm so far out of the many I've seen. Uh, so I've, I hope you found this helpful and thank you for watching.